it'll be more in uh, the area of 100 or perhaps 150, 200, somewhere in there. But the Pentagon is still not giving any final figures. Judy? All right, Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. Now quickly back to Aaron. Judy, thanks. I'm just going to stay off to the side here and allow the camera to stay focused on the scene. We, we're keeping our eye on that gray building in I wish I could see the monitor better. Let me just look at it in roughly the, the tallest building I think you can see. Gary Tuckman, who has been down on the ground and, in fact, one of the few civilians into the ground zero area. Uh, Gary, can you hear me? Gary Tuckman, are you able to hear me now? Aaron, I hear you fine. I, I want to tell you, an hour and 15 minutes ago, as you said, I was at ground zero with one to 2,000 rescue and recovery workers at the scene. They are all being evacuated as we speak. Most of them are now gone because of that one Liberty Plaza building, which is just to the east of the World Trade Center complex. We have talked to rescue workers who tell us they saw the building starting to twist and then said they saw some windows starting to break. Well, we're, we're, we are seeing the windows breaking from where we're standing. We can see the windows falling out or facing falling out. Okay, you have another angle, and you certainly have a better angle than me, because from our angle, we're to the north of the building. We haven't seen the windows, so that's interesting information. I want to tell you, Aaron, that there are a lot of people who are at the site who are very frightened by that, because they had told us while we were there that they were quite worried about one or two of the buildings surrounding the World Trade Center complex. They had told us that while we were there, and now they're living through it. We can also tell you the media has been pushed back several blocks also from the perch that we were at about four blocks away from the World Trade Center complex. Gary, if you can, and if you can't, just quickly say so. Orient me here. I'm standing here looking at what was Building 7. I look to my left, to the east. The tall gray building, I believe, is One Liberty Plaza. Do I have this right? You have it absolutely right, Aaron. The tall gray building is One Liberty Plaza. There was some confusion initially because across from One Liberty Plaza is a hotel called the Millennium Hotel. Some people thought that was the building in question. That building apparently is not in danger of collapse. It's the One Liberty Plaza, the tall gray building. Okay, and now also, just stay with me, Gary, if you will, please. Uh, what was left of the South Tower, uh, the World Trade Center, the South Tower was the second of those towers that was uh, struck yesterday by the plane. What was left of it collapsed upon itself uh, a bit ago, a while ago. Whether that impacted the One Liberty Plaza building, whether that made it more unstable or not, I, we just don't know. It's hard, uh, to, it's hard to tell, Aaron, but as I was telling you while we were talking in our last hour, those pillars from that South Tower look very precarious. It looked like Stonehenge in Salisbury, England, the way it was standing up. It looked precarious. They were very concerned about that, so people are not surprised that happened. I also want to tell you one other thing about One Liberty Plaza. It is set up to be the triage unit, but unfortunately, there's not a problem with evacuating it right now because they haven't found any survivors recently to put in the triage unit. All right, that's One Liberty Plaza. Uh, let's do this. Let, let's just keep an eye on this for, uh, for a bit. Among the, the businesses in One Liberty Plaza, uh, the, the corporate offices, the executive offices of the NASDAQ, uh, the stock markets, Wall Street is right here uh, in this part of town. Uh, Moneyline anchor Lou Dobbs joins us now. Uh, while there has been no trading here, there has been business going on around the world, and Lou can update us now on that. Lou? Aaron, thank you very much. Indeed, the building you're looking at, the, uh, the new headquarters of the uh, NASDAQ, it, uh, like uh, the World Trade Center towers themselves in the heart of downtown Manhattan, which is the heart of the world's financial capital. And indeed, the World Trade Towers were at the center of downtown Manhattan and uh, for creating great energy for what is the, the center of democratic capitalism all around the world. Now all of that, of course, has been rent by this despicable act of terrorism. We're only beginning now to learn the human toll, to learn about the property damage the devastation and the devastation obviously is not ended. Against this backdrop, the leaders of the financial markets, financial and corporate leaders, meeting with government leaders today, joining together, trying to determine when they might be able to reopen for trading. We now know that for only the second time since the end of World War II, the stock markets will be closed not for two, but for at least three days. And as yet another building threatens now to collapse in the complex, 
Uh, we know that the markets will be closed for a third straight session. That has not happened, by the way, since the Great Depression of 1933. Those markets, uh, as I said, have been closed now for two days. They will be closed again tomorrow. Christine Romans is here now and has more for us on that part of the story. Christine. Lou, it's an unprecedented tragedy for New York's financial district and for world markets and a rare occurrence in financial market history as well. U.S. stock markets will be closed for three straight weekdays. We are committed that the equity markets will resume operations no later than Monday. The group that gathered today will gather again tomorrow with the idea that we may well be in a position to resume trading as early as Friday. Grim exchange officials and regulators chose the path of caution. The worry, of course, is that keeping stock markets shut will only exacerbate the, unnerv the nervousness and the uneasiness in the market that causes people to sell. Uh, a big sell-off is already expected when stock markets open. In the meantime, bonds and bond futures will begin trading tomorrow. The bond market uh, you know, functions more appropriately and best when the stock market and the bond market are uh, trading together. But we can certainly trade bonds without stocks for 24 to 48 hours. Given the extent of the crisis smoldering in downtown Manhattan, economists say caution was the best path to take. But they do fear there could be panic selling when markets do open. And I strongly urge investors to sit tight because it will be that, simply panic selling. Uh, nothing fundamentally uh, has changed. Lou, people on Wall Street clearly would like to send a signal, get stock markets trading in, show that democracy and capitalism uh, can't But they say the human toll and the recovery and the healing comes first. And of course, uh, as uh, Aaron Brown has just been reporting, uh, when uh, One Liberty Plaza, one of the tallest remaining buildings and certainly one of the most important itself, uh, is in some danger of collapse apparently as well. And there are other buildings there as well. It is uh, all but impossible with any assurance uh, for these leaders to put these markets open at the risk of uh, any employee's life, of which there has already been such a devastating loss uh, already. Christine, thank you very much. Well, the brokerage firm Morgan Stanley some 3,500 employees resided uh, within the World Trade Center. It uh, was, in fact, the largest tenant in the World Trade Center, 3,700 employees across 20 floors. Many of those workers tonight remain unaccounted for. Peter Viles now has the story for us. The second terrorist attack was a direct hit on the office space of Morgan Stanley. The firm had 3,500 workers in 22 floors, almost exactly in the area where the second plane hit. But incredibly, most of those employees had already fled the tower minutes before the explosion. Miraculously, I'd say, uh, we had 2,500 people in World Trade Center 2, 1,000 uh, people in World Trade Center 5. Uh, it appears the vast majority uh, got out safely. A miracle made possible by the firm's split-second decision to evacuate the South Tower immediately after the North Tower was hit. We have a lot of stories of uh, courage, uh, a lot of stories of uh, compassion, and uh, we're going to be we're going to be fine. You can see a very emotional Philip Purcell. No official word from Morgan Stanley on how many of its employees are unaccounted for at this hour, but we have counted, uh, can canvassed rather, many other firms in that complex. This is a very partial count, we much stress, but we do know at this hour that other firms in that complex are telling us that 2,700, 2,700 workers in the complex remain unaccounted for, and that, we must tell you, is a very partial count. Lou? And uh, the toll is just unspeakable uh, in point of fact. Uh about those numbers at this point. Uh, we all and as we see behind us right now, the, uh, the damage to these structures continues. Peter, thank you very much. The well, airports uh, tonight remain closed uh, throughout the country. Officials say now that they will not reopen until new security measures are put into effect. As a result of those closures, 
Airlines, of course, are losing millions of dollars in revenue. That is simply the latest hurdle for this industry. Uh, airlines have watched their profits uh, fall dramatically over the course of the past two years, and the economic slowdown has done nothing but accelerate that to losses. Kitty Pilgrim now takes a look at the industry. Thanks, Lou. Well, with air traffic at a standstill, the disruption of commerce is almost incalculable. But that does not stop economists from trying to assess the damage. Now, the airline business in this country generates about 90 to $100 billion in revenues. And that's just domestic travel. That's about 4,000 planes a day. A little more than half of that business is business travel, which probably will see a drop off in months to come. And leisure travel may also dry up. So losses work out to about $250 million a day. I'm sure it will be a gradual uh, flyback. Uh, probably on the west coast you'll see the flight activity come back before the east coast. Um, but really what I'm concerned about right now are the lingering effects of the fear of terrorism, uh, the impact that will have on airline bookings, and overall consumer confidence. All right, also Midway Airlines, which has been teetering on the brink of bankruptcy, announced it will suspend operations, saying that they don't have the resources to reorganize in this environment. In terms of temporary disruption, retail sales and consumption, that's two-thirds of the economy. It's about $300 billion a month. Now, economists calculate even a two-day disruption of shopping and purchases would add up to $15 billion. That's a 6% decline for the month. This could be seen yesterday at many malls. Many were deserted. A smattering were closed for security reasons. Now, for example, the Mall of America in Minneapolis. Lou? Kitty, thank you very much. The the cost of yesterday's deadly attack in New York City will not, of course, be known for months uh, uh, in all likelihood. Some experts are already calling it the most expensive man-made disaster ever. Insurance claims alone are expected to reach $15 billion. Greg Clarkin joins us now from Lower Manhattan with the details of that part of the story. Greg? The attacks on the World Trade Center struck at the heart of Wall Street, New York's primary economic engine. But the attacks may also have a severe impact on the city's second biggest economic driver, tourism. And it's the impact on tourism that has many worried. More than 37 million people visited New York City last year, spending more than $17 billion on everything from restaurants to Broadway shows to hotels. And when job creation and other factors are figured in, it's estimated tourism has a more than $25 billion impact on New York City's economy. But the images of the attacks beamed worldwide may keep some tourists at home. This is a clear negative blow to this economy. You know, one of the important and growing industries in New York has been tourism. And uh, certainly this kind of heightened terrorist activity will frighten away tourists. There are numerous other areas which could be hit hard as well. Retailers big and small are already suffering with stores closed in lower Manhattan as the cleanup efforts continue. And some believe it may be a while before New Yorkers take to the stores. The consumers stay home. They, they want to watch television. They want to watch the events unfold throughout the day, all night as we did, as, as everybody across the country did. The last thing that they're thinking about is going out and buying a new shirt. Well, in any tragedy, and this uh, tragedy is unspeakable in its dimensions, there are unfortunately some who will try to take advantage of others. Deborah Marchini is here now and has for us the story of uh, what is simply price gouging by some, particularly in the area of gasoline. That's right, and particularly in the area of the Midwest. It's interesting, Lou, because the attack, of course, devastated New York and Washington, but uh, the spike in gasoline prices in the long lines as well were mostly in the Midwest. The scattered stations in Indiana, Ohio, and Oklahoma, for example, uh, we saw prices ranging from $2.99 all the way up to $5.19 a gallon. Now the region's especially vulnerable to any interruptions in supplies and consumers there know it. Uh, it's like what I call the St. Louis snow effect. One of the things that we see in St. Louis is we have about four snowstorms a year and they're typically not a big deal, doesn't disrupt traffic for very long, but if you go to your local grocery store you'll find 10 registers running full open with customers 10 deep all buying milk and bread. And I think American consumers have been trained to believe that if there is some impact that could involve the Middle East, you better gas up. And that's what they did all at once. And the supply system is not geared to handle that sort of surge in demand. 
And the problem is demand because supplies were not affected by the attacks. The American Petroleum Institute, for example, reported today that fuel inventories rose by about 159,000 barrels. Now, major oil companies, including ExxonMobil and BP Amico, froze prices to wholesalers. Chevron promised to exercise restraint, and Conoco wouldn't comment.